Hi, Friedrich August von Hayek was one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century. That's why we at the Austrian Economic Center and the Friedrich August von Hayek Institute decided to look at his ideas again and how they apply to today's world in our series, What Would Hayek Say? I'm Kai Weiss. You have to bear with me today because Scott is out of office for this week. If you don't like what you hear, he will be back in a week. Um, I will today look at one of the most significant ideas of Friedrich August von Hayek, or perhaps I would say the most significant idea of his, namely the spontaneous order. It's not only his idea, it's a tradition in a sense that has been ongoing for many many centuries, uh, all the way back even to ancient China, but also the Scottish Enlightenment, the beginning of the Austrian School of Economics, um, conservative thinkers, like Edmund Burke, Alexis de Tocqueville, and others. But I think when it comes to Hayek, it kind of, the entire idea of spontaneous order reached its apex, at least so far. Um, spontaneous order, I think, is the most convincing defense of individual liberty, free markets, combined with a healthy civil society, with tradition, social mores, and much more. And I will just try to explain that in a few minutes, what this theory is all about. Now, for that, I think we need to take a step back. We need to look at the state of the social sciences today. And one Hayekian scholar called Pete Betke from George Mason University, he looked at the social sciences and he said there's a prevalence of two dysfunctions. One of them is over-socialization, the other one is under-socialization. Under-socialization is kind of uh, a critique that economists often get when it comes to the economic man or the homo economicus. It's very prevalent in neoclassical, more mainstream economics. It's based on the belief, sort of, or the assumption that the individual actor in society is always acting rationally, is always targeting his maximum economic gain. Um, and is not really influenced by social context, by emotions and stuff like that. He's always kind of this robot that is trying to maximize his uh, economic gain by rational decision making. The other problem, uh, for instance, in behavioral economics is over socialization. When it comes to over socialization, um, the social context, for instance, is accounted for. Um, individuals are not assumed to be always rational. They instead are part of a social world and they are often influenced by different factors. But in many regards, it goes too far into the other extreme, meaning that um, basically the individual vanishes within that social context. The individual is only influenced and never really makes his own decisions. And both over and under socialization have a very similar result, namely that an individual is basically uh, some kind of robotic automaton um, that is only thinking about either economic reason, and only economic reason counts, or that is only influenced by the masses of society and doesn't really count anymore. Now, the spontaneous order approach takes a different approach because it looks at the individual, it follows the approach of methodological individualism. Uh, methodological individualism basically means that only an individual can act. Collective groups don't have a will. For instance, the government. The government doesn't do anything. It's always individuals doing things. But at the same time, the individual is very much part of society. An individual is born into a family with parents, with siblings, with family members, with friends. Um, an individual is part of a society of different, um, of, of a social fabric that basically has traditions, social mores, social rules and stuff like that, that certainly influences the individual. It's not um, one rational individualist being, it's part of something. Um, and that certainly is an important element. But not only that human beings are part of society, they also want to be part of society. Because in many regards, we humans are social animals. We want to be around people, at least most of us, um, and we enjoy the company of others. But beyond that, especially when we look at the economy, we can clearly see how 
cooperation with one another, voluntary cooperation, can bear extremely fruitful results. Rather than doing everything by oneself, it is much more opportune to collaborate with one another. And there are so many theories, free trade, 101 theories that I'm not going into right now, that prove that. Something else is also happening when there's economic cooperation, however. Certain patterns and certain institutions will naturally emerge bottom up. So one very, very important example is language. Languages are not implemented top down by some government. They're kind of developing by themselves, by people trying to communicate with one another and they just make grumbling sounds to try to, uh, you know, make people understand what they want. And after a while, there are certain words, what's, what eventually become words, that kind of are used in that way by everyone. And so in a bottom-up way, language emerges rather than through a commission of language, a, a central committee or something like this. They just develop by themselves. And this is the case with so many other institutions, with so many market institutions, with so many social institutions, actually with most of them. When we look at the price system in the market, when we look at money, when we look at different ways how we cooperate and trade with one another, it all happens kind of by itself. One very, very popular example of that is the one by Leonard Reed from Fee, which is the pencil. There's no human being in this world today that can produce a, that can produce a pencil all by himself. Millions of people are part of this process of creating one single pencil. The pencil is really cheap and nobody really knows that they are part of this really, really complex system, this really, really complex process of creating a pencil, but millions of people are working on this every day to get all the material to produce the pencil. Um, and it just kind of happens. Nobody is directing it. Nobody is planning it, at least not centrally. It's, it simply happens. And this is the great insight when it comes to the economic effects of the spontaneous order, namely that through that individual cop or that cooperation between individuals, we can see this kind of patterns and institutions develop bottom up. And through that, the economy has the opportunity to become much more complex, much more um, innovative, dynamic, and especially prosperous. It can become all of that um, because you have this cooperative element and this kind of invisible hand, as Adam Smith called it, um, kind of working, uh, planning the economy in the background, but it's really no one actually planning it. And yeah, the results have been absolutely spectacular uh, when it comes to merely material means. Uh, we are living in the greatest age in history, the most prosperous, at least pre-corona, the most prosperous age, the most innovative, uh, with the least poverty and with many fold opportunities to travel, to collaborate with others. And yet it's not only the economy that sees the effects of the spontaneous order coming into being. Often neglected, but still true, um, the spontaneous order also has its application in the social realm, and maybe even more importantly so. As I said, and, uh, humans are social animals. They are part of a social fabric, and that social fabric is also the result of a spontaneous order of people living in communities, working together, collaborating with one another, and developing certain mechanisms certain patterns of how to live together. That happens, this happens throughout history. As Cicero, for instance, said, the, the uh, Roman philosopher, um, he, the world that he lives in, or that he lived in back then, was not shaped by one man's talent, by, but, but by that of many. And not in one person's lifetime, but over many generations. This just happens that when people cooperate, social institutions, social rules, traditions, mores, um, and just ways of living develop, the social fabric develops. It's kind of throughout history how we accumulate this repository of knowledge, as you all have been, calls it. And I think nobody really put it better than Roger Scruton. He said, the knowledge that we need in the unforeseeable circumstances of human life is neither derived from nor contained in the experience of a single person nor can it be deduced a priori from universal laws. This knowledge is bequeathed to us by customs, 
by institutions and habits of thought that have shaped themselves over generations through the trials and errors of people, many of whom have perished in the course of acquiring it. Not a single person can create a society, cannot create a true community of people that kind of define themselves as part of a community. Not one person can develop an economy that is as prosperous because no single human being has the knowledge of everything that is going on in the world. And that's good. That's actually not bad, even though socialists hate that fact, even though they always try to direct and plan everything. It's actually good because through that, we have a different mechanism. We have that mechanism of the spontaneous order. The spontaneous order um, provides us with the opportunity that people themselves make decisions, that people themselves come together voluntarily, cooperate with one another, and without actually always knowing it, develop what we call society, what we call also the economy. And the results are usually spectacular. And the results are, if not with too much government intrusion along the way, with the government only setting the framework, um, the results are usually, through the free market, enormous economic prosperity, but at the same time, a healthy civil society. By not getting rid of traditions, by not getting rid of social institutions because they are ancient or mystical or something like that, but by realizing that they provide the free economic actors, the sort of social background, the social fabric to fall back on and to live their life. In that sense, so, uh, spontaneous order is a highly democratic type of social organization because it's the people, the demos, doing everything, not the government from the top down. It's a bottom-up process and it's an incredibly important process, especially today. Today we see calls for more centralization, for more government from all sides across the political spectrum. But the spontaneous order shows how problems are often solved in a decentralized way, the best way. That they are solved not by some wise man planning everything, but by individuals planning their lives and, plan and, and looking at other people that they care for. And it is also, and that is an important point for Friedrich Hayek, a great defense of civilization itself. We don't know how our world will look like, and we don't have to. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to plan everything out. We should simply look at our own life and how we can best develop our own life and the, life that we, uh, the lives of others that we care for. As he said, if we are to advance, we must leave room for a continuous revision of our present conceptions and ideals, which will be necessitated by further experience. We are as little able to conceive what civilization will be or can be 500 or even 50 years. Hence, as our medieval forefathers or even our grandparents were able to foresee our manner of life today. The spontaneous order is an argument in favor of markets, of spontaneous civil society, and of decentralized political decision making whenever political decision making is necessary. It's highly applicable for today, and it's one of the reasons why Hayek is still so relevant today. Now, if you want to find out more about Spontaneous Order, um, I have a, a series of articles on our website, and we will link to it down in the box, in the information box of this YouTube video. Thanks for listening, and again, thank goodness Scott will be back in one week. <laughs>